Now, before we get started reassembling this, you're gonna need some specialty tools. If you want to use the same tools that I'm using in this video, I'll have Amazon links in the description below for everything that I bought, and you can go be like me and spend way more money than you should on tools, as long as you hide the receipts from your wife or girlfriend. If you're wondering how we got the differential case looking this good, go ahead and click that icon in the top right hand corner of your screen and get caught up with the previous episodes. We're still working on our differential rebuild and as you can see we still got some parts that are full of grease, grit, and grime that we're going to be cleaning up today and then starting the reassembly process. You guys wanted some more details about all of the bearings, the part numbers, seals, part numbers, and that's what this video today is going to be all about is giving you all those nitty gritty details. Now keep in mind as you can see this bearing is 32307CN. Um, all these bearings I'm going to give the part numbers for. If your bearing number that pulls out of your diff is not the same number as the ones you see here then they are of a different size. <clears throat> so you need to take a caliper or micrometer and measure the inside, the outside, and the thickness of that bearing. There's a few that are listed. I bought all of these bearings on Rock Auto um, for various reasons that maybe we'll get into a little bit later on in the video. But um, there were some part numbers that were listed for the R180 rear end under the uh, part number interchange for the 1978 Datsun or Nissan 280Z on their part number interchange list. So just keep that in mind. Um, those are pretty generic when they start running all that stuff together. And they do have incorrect part numbers and seal numbers through there. So you might want to click on the 1 or 15 that they have listed and measure it and then see if it matches what you have. So just a little buyer beware information there. As you can see, I left the... Uh, the original bearing on the pinion and we're just pulling that off with the bearing uh, separator and I'll leave the old pinion nut on that pinion as well so I don't want to damage the threads as I'm pulling that thing off and I'm just cleaning up the little side axles here degreasing everything and then we're gonna scotch bright where the seal rides uh, that way it doesn't tear the lips of the new seals and that's kind of important these things get wear patterns in them and if you just stick them back in then there's a high likelihood that you could rip a brand new seal and that's the whole point of rebuilding it, is to get it resealed and uh, not leaking here's some shims on the pinion uh, these shims are very important and the orientation is very important okay so you're gonna have a thicker shim that has a bevel side and a chamfer side and then you're gonna have this little bitty paper thin shim that I'm going to give you the measurements on right now. The most important reason that those shims are in there is to set the pinion depth. Now, back in the day, Nissan had a special tool, and there are several specialty rear-end tools uh, that you can buy but are not required. I will go over all these specialty tools later on in this video, and as you can see, I'm using a Mitutoyu uh, digital caliper. This thing is freaking awesome. I love this. I should have got it a long time ago. If you're interested in buying one yourself, there's an Amazon link in the description below. Now that little shim is only three, three and a half thou, three and a quarter thou thick, and then we go into the uh, the thicker shim, and both of these shims are there to just set the pinion depth, which is a very important measurement that kind of sets the tone for how the rest of the build is going to go. Anybody across the pond, there you go, 3.21 millimeter, and then uh, plus the 0.08 or 0.09, whatever it was, millimeter on the other shim. So just cleaned everything up real quick with a Scotch-Brite pad. As you can see, all the bearing surfaces where those bearings are going to go on are nice and shiny now, completely free of grease, and that's exactly what you want. Uh, the bevel side goes towards the actual gear, and then the chamfer side goes towards the pinion nut. So keep that in mind when you're putting this thing back together, uh, and then drop that little shim in there. 32307, that's the first bearing that you're going to be putting on, and as you can see, the numbers match, and that's kind of what you want. You don't want to put the wrong bearing in the wrong place. I got national bearings. Um, I know there's lovers of all different kinds of brands, uh, but if you know me at all, I am absolutely not brand loyal. I do like uh, SKF. I do like Timken, uh, but I couldn't get a whole set of all of those brands' bearings for this rebuild. So all I could find was the National for like uh, 
two or three of the bearings and then I was able to source the rest of the national bearings uh, for the whole entire diff. So that's kind of what I stuck with and why. Again, I, I could care less whether it's Temkin, SKF, or national. Uh, once you get behind the, the engineering of how these bearings are all made and manufactured, um, it really comes down to quality control checks as to determine what kind of bearing you're going to get. There are some companies that don't do any quality control checks or one every thousand or ten thousand. Um, but these work out fine and there's an off chance that you could get any bearing from any company in your hands and it have not been checked and it end up being a bad bearing so take that for what you will uh we press that bearing on the shaft again with the pinion spacers where they should be and now we're just getting to setting the races in the diff now i'm just using a pretty generic seal and race driver set there's a amazon link in the description below if you don't have one uh, they're a great tool to have and as you can see I'm not beating it in with a hammer and I highly recommend not beating them in with a hammer. There are instances somewhere else on the car where you can just tap the races in with a hammer. A differential is not something I would recommend doing that on. So I use a, just a regular shop press along with those bearing and race seal driver kits and then press the races into place. Then you put on your uh, bearing spacer collar along with that shim and then the next bearing uh, so all I'm doing here is just dropping the next new race in and then I use the old race to give me enough room and the proper sizing and everything to drop in on top of it before I put on the seal driver and then that whole little kit to drive everything in uh, and these you drive in until they're absolutely flush. You put in as much pressure as you pretty much possibly can without breaking or cracking the case open. Uh, make sure they're all the way down in their proper spots. We're measuring things here with inch pounds and thousands of an inch. So if they're not driven all the way down, you're going to know it pretty quickly when it goes back together. These two bearings are the carrier bearings, 30209C. Also, a little alternate part number, I think it's uh, 37 one, or I'm sorry, 57 160. And as you can see, even these national brand bearings, Koyo made in Japan. So I don't get too hung up on the OEM specific stuff ever, really, uh, except for in this case. There is one bearing that I did have to buy uh, from OEM Nissan, courtesy parts Nissan, and that's a hundred dollar bearing so that's one main reason you really want to avoid having to buy oem bearings uh, because they are so freaking expensive so it's one of those situations uh, where if you want to rebuild one with all oem bearings by all means you do you but you need to understand one very important thing is nissan never made bearings ever they had an engineer sit down at a desk with his really thick glasses and a big calculator and calculate all the loads and wear patterns and everything else that that bearing would undergo in its useful lifespan. And all bearings have a useful lifespan. Once they wear out, they need to be replaced. So the aftermarket or bearing manufacturing market comes into play for the manufacturing of all of the bearings all over the world. Now there are different brands and different specifics, but they all have to comply with those same standards. So again, you pay for the difference in quality control, and there is a chance that even from Nissan OEM genuine parts that you could have your hands on a bad bearing that didn't get inspected. So you do what you want, you spend money where you think you need to spend it, and save it where you think you can get away with it. If you're noticing, I'm uh, again pressing these bearings on, and I just use that little collar spacer there because if you just press these things flush, you're going to end up with a couple thousandths of a gap between the bottom of that bearing and where it should be seating on the carrier. You don't want these bearings flush, and that's why I'm using that little open collar there. You want them all the way down on the carrier, and that's really, really important when it comes to shimming the carrier within the differential case itself. So pay attention to these details. They do matter. Now this right here is the instance, one and only instance, where I buy a genuine Nissan bearing because you cannot find them in the aftermarket world whatsoever. I posted the original part number up above 
And just keep in mind the 83601 is different than the 83601 Alpha. They, uh, they have different measurements. So depending on which one you pull out of your case will be dependent on which part number you should be ordering. So again, break out the calipers, take some measurements. That little um, spacer right there along with the shim, the spacer, the big collar, only goes on in one direction. So you can't put it on backwards. Don't be afraid of that. Same with the shim. It doesn't really matter. And then you drop that uh, second bearing, that little intermediate bearing in. And then this uh, spacer sleeve is actually a crush sleeve. It doesn't really crush though. So it does not need to be replaced unless it's absolutely broken. And then the ball bearing goes on top and then you have your pinion flange and then your nut. Your original nuts you want to discard. You do not want to put that back on the differential when you go to reassemble it for its last and final time. There is a situation and where you would use that old nut but it's to measure the initial pinion preload and that's it. We need something to torque it to 137 I believe to 154 foot pounds of torque and then take the measurement without the seal on according to the uh, factory service manual which I will have a link for in the description if you don't have an FSM and you need all these specs then there's one available to download uh, just click the link in the description and go get the one you need so hope that helps but here you can just see I'm putting a little oil on the bearings before we put them in the case and that's just to kind of aid and in installation and make sure everything runs smoothly and there's no <clears throat> there's no burrs or any kind of uh, dirt debris or trash getting something hung up and uh, causing maybe an inaccurate reading later on in the process so you stick the pinion in remember the races are already inside the diff and set properly and then that bearing goes on then the little shaft collar and then you're going to stick on your roller bearing again i lube all of this stuff this is just regular 80 90 weight oil if you're rebuilding an open rear end which this one is uh, it is not a limited slip there is no need and i will repeat this there is no need to put synthetic oil and overpay for synthetic garbage in your open dinosaur oil loving differential okay get the real stuff Dinosaurs died for a reason. It's so you could put good oil in your differential. Now, if you do rebuild to a limited slip, uh, either viscous limited slip, OBX, or the Quaif, however you pronounce all that stuff, um, then, yeah, sure, go with the 7590, the synthetic stuff, spend the extra money, um, because it does have additives that are a requirement for that limited slip to function properly. So... Here you can see I'm just stacking some old bearings here at the bottom and um, you just drive the pinion in using the same race and seal driver. Drive the pinion in through those two bearings along with the ball bearing attached on the front, that roller ball bearing, just to the point where it goes through the diff. Okay, You do not want to be driving this down like you're driving a race into a case or the carrier bearings onto the actual carrier. You just want this pinion to go through it. You don't actually want to get 20 tons of pressure because these are all bearing surfaces here. So you don't want to apply that much pressure to all that stuff. All these uh, flanges here are gonna get the treatment. They've already got sandblasted. They're gonna get degreased and painted up real nice like, like I do everything else. So we'll go over some more details of these uh, side axles later on. But boom, there it is, nice and shiny, looking good. Now, as you can see, I don't have a seal in the front of this yet. So the factory service manual mentions two measurements that you should take, and then I'm using the old pinion nut, as you can see there. So I just want to torque everything down to the spec of, I always go to the minimum on the pinion preload, and you just use your little uh, pinion wrench. I made one. I've got a link for one in the description below and we're going to torque this to 137 foot-pounds. The reason being I go to the bottom end of the torque spec uh, and it's always a good idea to continue moving that pinion back and forth as you're torquing this uh, to make sure you're not binding anything up. Uh, the reason I go to the 137 or uh, the minimum torque spec is because if I'm low on the pinion preload, meaning the pinion preload is just under what the uh, spec calls for then I can always tighten that nut up if I go too tight uh, it's really hard to kind of loosen everything up because you've drove the bearings further on the shaft 
than where they would have been. So I don't really know if that makes sense. If it doesn't, maybe drop a comment and I'll explain. But here you can see I'm taking my inch pound torque wrench. There's a link for that tool in the description below. Again, you will need that. Um, I've seen people do the whole just spin it with your hand and if it gets less than a half a turn then you're good to go. The, that's maybe can work in some cases. That's not something I'm willing to rely on. So I rotate this thing around three or four or five times in both directions and then it's got a maximum um, reading pin that as you're rotating it you reset that pin. So it will take more force just like anything overcoming friction to get going. So the first initial reading you're going to get will always be higher than what it will take to keep it rotating. So just keep that in mind when you're doing that measurement. If it's peaking out around, you know, 15 to 20 inch pounds, don't freak out. Try to look at that needle as you're using that tool around uh, your little circle path there. And I'm just going to show you what we're looking at here. We got about, um, looks like right on 14 inch pounds. So you can see it's a little bit tighter by about three inch pounds uh, than it should be without a seal according to the factory service manual. So I'm really not concerned too terribly so about that reading being that I did put oil on the bearings. If you do this measurement dry uh, with no oil on the bearings, it will probably be lower. So again, take that into consideration. And then undo the old nuts, um, use the bearing separator, pull off the companion or the pinion flange, and then we are going to drive in our pinion seal. Now this seal, 2011 Federal Mogul, uh, again, bought off Rock Auto. If you wanna buy the OEM Nissan thing, go for it. Uh, but that's like a $20 seal and that's absurd. So uh, I just get the generic stuff. It works just as good most of the time. You do wanna put a little bit of grease on the lips of the actual seal, as well as the flange where that seal rides to mainly prevent uh, you ripping or tearing or causing any potential leaks on this brand new seal. So like I say, take the time, scotch bright where that seal rides, and then just apply a little bit of a... Uh, I got some Molly EP grease. It doesn't really matter what kind of grease you use here. Just a little bit of grease to help and aid with the installation. And so we're going to lube both the uh, pinion flange, as you can see, where that bearing rides. I've already scotch brighted. I just use a little gray scotch bright pad. You can get ready with a maroon one if that's all you got. And then I'm just using the old trick of uh, tapping it into place using an old race because, as you can see, that pinion actually comes through. So you're not going to be able to use your standard seal drivers unless you're just tapping it on the edge which if you if that's what you want to do then go for it i'm just showing you uh, different ways that you can get away and around some of these difficult tasks as you move forward in this differential rebuild and you want to drive this pinion seal flush you do not want to drive it down all the way or beyond flush so as soon as it gets flush stop driving the seal you're done go ahead and install the companion flange. And now when you install the companion flange with the seal for the last time after you've taken your initial measurement without the seal and it is within spec, then you want to use a new pinion nut. Now I did buy one of these brand new nuts uh, from Nissan, courtesy parts Nissan to be specific, uh, because this is a true lock nut, all right? So the nut is not meant to be reused. It is a one-time use Thing, and that's why I reused the old one simply to take an initial inch pound pinion preload measurement on these new bearings and see how close we were. And again, we were only about two to three inches higher than uh, what the FSM requires. Now, I'm not really going to be concerned of that unless it's another five or ten inches higher with the seal installed. So we'll take a second measurement here in a little bit. But it's kind of funny, you may be wondering why I'm buying some parts from, you know, Courtesy Parts Nissan. There's the part number if you want to get one yourself. Well, it's pretty simple. The dealership used to be a place you would absolutely avoid because of the high prices of most, if not all, of the parts you would ever get from there. Fortunately for us in today's age, that is not always the case anymore. Unfortunately, uh, from what I have found is a lot of the Datsun uh, aftermarket support type companies that I love to support uh, 
are unfortunately quite a bit higher on some of these OEM parts and that was the case with that nut and a few other parts is they're selling OEM genuine Nissan parts on their website for literally double the amount of money that you can get that part for from a dealership so here we're taking our second reading with the seal installed we're doing it the same way again with that uh, inch pound torque wrench and we're just trying to be nice easy and smooth throughout the entire 360 degrees of rotation and while you're rotating it you're resetting that max dial and we're coming up with a reading right in the middle of 14 and 15 so that puts us right about 14 and a half inch pounds which is right below the upper limit of 14.8 inch pounds as dictated by the uh, factory service manual here's the uh, carrier main caps the while they may look like they can go on either way you only want to put them on one way and that's the proper way and the thumbs up which is a good time for you to hit the thumbs up on this video if you enjoy this content so far so some shims these are the carrier shims 99.9% .9 of any issue that you're ever gonna have uh, whether it be howling or any kind of noise coming from the rear end is gonna be an incorrect contact between the pinion and ring gear and uh, the pinion depth has a lot to do with that as well as these carrier shims now like I said before in another video you want to pay particular attention to what shim comes off of what side and I'm going to be showing you here what is the result from that if you put them in incorrectly uh, just to kind of showcase that these things do come apart and they go back together relatively easy so we have three shims in this build one's a 2.45 this one's right over uh, eight we'll call it eight mil and then this third one right here is a thinner one at 2.25 mil now I'm doing everything in mil because uh, well, it's a metric diff, so I like to take everything in thousandths of an inch, but I know there's a lot of people across the pond that watch this stuff as well. And plus, this car came from across the pond, so we'll keep it all in metric. Uh, maybe I'll bounce back and forth between the thousandths of an inch and metric for anybody here in the States. Uh, but if you get you a Mitutoyu digital caliper, you can take either your preferred measurement. So link in the description below if you want to buy one yourself now I'm just going to clean up the sides of the bearing the surfaces make sure there's no dust debris or anything like that and I do the same thing to the races put the races on the bearings after they've been cleaned and then slip them into the case once again you want to make sure the case is just as clean as the bearings uh, because these shims are very very specific in measurements so if there's any kind of a uh, little piece of grit or grease that you left in there that can and will throw off your measurements so what we're going to do initially uh, especially with the original gear set is I'm going to put these shims in incorrectly I'm going to put the thicker shims so that 8 mil and the 2.45 mil on the right side okay these these shims fit in between the the outside of the race and the case so you'll see me driving those in here later on, but I'm going to put the 8 mil and the 2.45 mil on the right side, which leaves me the 2.25 mil on the left side. And what that does is it shifts the whole carrier over to the left. And as a result, that ring gear will be further away distance-wise to the pinion. Okay, and that really affects one critical measurement that we call backlash, which I'll show you later on in this video what you're looking for. The factory service manual says we should be shooting for five to seven thousandths of an inch backlash, and that is simply the play between the ring gear and the pinion. Okay, so you should hear like little click, 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 moving the ring gear back and forth to the pinion. That, that free play is called backlash. Uh, when you're measuring something that tight of tolerance, five to seven thousandths of an inch, if it's below that, it's out of spec. If it's above that, it's out of spec. Then you have to pick different shims to get that carrier where it should be, left to right within the case, so that it contacts that pinion correctly. If you do have to re-shim it or buy different shims, you want to make sure that the total measurement between the outs or the insides of the case 
does not change. Meaning if we have a 2.45 inch shim or mill shim 2.45 and then we have a 2.25 okay if we move up on one or down on one we have to replace that exact amount on the other side so we don't change the preload because we do have to drive these things in we don't change the preload on the carrier bearings themselves so if you just took a 2.45 mil and you thought you were going to go down to a 2.0 or 2.40 so from 2.45 to 2.40 that's only 0.05 mil difference but if you didn't make up that difference on the left side meaning you just left that 2.25 mil in there you've now changed the preload on the carrier bearings not the pinion bearing but you've changed the preload on the carrier bearings and that will affect wear and all that stuff too so if you go down to a 2.40 on one side you have to go up from a 2.25 to a 2.30 and I'm just using those numbers because that's what I have that's what I've measured for you guys to see you're gonna have to measure your shims in your case as all this stuff was uh, cast parts they're not precision and that's why they have different shims in them so my shims may not be the exact same size shim that you have uh, you're just going to have to measure with the what you end up with as you take it apart. So I hope that helps kind of uh, give a little insight onto what's going on with the carrier preload, the preload on the carrier bearings, the preload on the pinion bearings, and then what we'll get to later on is the backlash and how that's really, really important as well. All right, so we've got the... 8 mil and the 2.45 mil on the right side of the case and I've slid in this is where that preload kind of comes into effect so I've slid in that 2.25 mil on the left side so now I'm kind of squeezing those races against the bearings on the carrier and you can see how tight this is they make a special drift tool where you can make your own or you can just be like me and be really really careful if you have something like a shim smaller than a 2.25 or a two mil like I probably wouldn't be hammering it this way I would make a drift or or something that will fit around the outer circumference of that entire shim to drive it in a little bit straighter and uh, have a better result but if you take your time and just give it light taps uh, you can get it into place so if you don't want to buy any more specialty tools than you have to just be very 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 careful and you can see this shim is still kind of sticking out of place so just showing you what I'm doing here is I'm kind of pulling it in with my thumb as I'm lightly tapping uh, that thing into place. And you can hear kind of the tones changing as it's flattening out and getting perfectly aligned with that, that bearing race. And that's what they should look like. They should look like they're almost part of the race. It should be flush, completely flush. And we've got the thick ones, the 8 mil and the 2.45 mil on the right side. And then we've got the 2.25 mil on the left side. Again, your shims and measurements might be different, but if you find yourself in need of changing the shims, do not change that actual overall measurement. Okay, that should not change. If you take one mil or a half a mil from one side, you have to replace it on the other side. And then we're just going to tighten these things down. The factory service manual wants the uh, carrier caps at 65 to 72 foot-pounds of torque. So we're just going to snug those up and then we're going to measure the backlash. Now, backlash is, again, the dead space between the pinion and the ring gear to where that ring gear or pinion can freely move. Now, as the differential heats up as you're driving down the road that measurement closes as metal heats and expands just like everything within a motor vehicle your initial tolerance is not necessarily the amount of gap it will always have you have that tolerance so that when it gets to temperature it's not completely closed and binding so five to seven thousandths of an inch is what we're looking for now i've purposely put the shims in the wrong place so i expect this measurement to be a bit higher as far as the backlash goes 
there's a lot of other differential rebuilding videos out there and none of them necessarily show you how to kind of play around with these measurements or the results you get from them when they're incorrect so I just wanted to take the time while I've got your attention and just kind of show you uh, sometimes the parts you think are working or maybe the bearings changed or or what have you but something's changed to where that factory service spec is something that you're not hitting uh, you're not within tolerance you're not within spec and kind of what to do in those situations so hopefully you guys can appreciate that and if you do click that like button for me as I would appreciate that from you guys so we're torquing these things down to about 70 foot pounds uh, factory service spec is 65 to 72 again check your own FSM I do have a link in the description below but here you can see I've got the uh, Noga articulating arm along with the Mitutoyu uh, dial caliper and we're getting about 10 thou of an inch backlash which is entirely too much so I've gone ahead and put the shims in their proper spaces I've took the uh, 2.45 put that on the left side put the 2.25 on the right side and all I'm looking for is I'm holding the pinion uh, flange as tight as I possibly can if you want to put this in a vise that would be a much better way to do it and I did that off camera but just to show you guys you're looking for the play alright you see it doesn't really matter where that dial ends up you're just looking for the amount of play back and forth and uh, this measurement I know the angle kinda looks weird but we're getting right at four and a half thou uh, backlash which is slightly it's a half thou below what's recommended for the tightest tolerance on the factory spec uh, but again, with brand new bearings that have never been really rotated, I expect I'll get a quarter thou a piece from pretty much everything in the differential. So at four and a half thou, uh, I can sleep at night and I'm not going to worry about it. The next thing you're going to need to check all this stuff and make sure everything is where it should be is some gear marking compound. I do have a link for this stuff in the description below if you want to buy it. It's uh, relatively cheap insurance. And I highly recommend doing this. Even if all these measurements come out perfectly, uh, this is a good final check before you just put the differential back together in the car and uh, call it good. If you're changing gear sets, if you're changing the ring and pinion gear while you're in there doing all this, it's a necessity. It is a requirement. You absolutely have to mark the gears and find out where they're interacting with each other. And this is kind of another thing. Um, you can find a lot of other videos about this where things just work out perfectly. Unfortunately, it worked out perfectly here. Uh, so I don't get to show you like how to mess with the, the heel and the toe and the rake and everything else. Uh, but if you want more details on that, there are much more differential specific rebuild videos out there that go into a lot more detail uh, with that stuff specifically. As you can see, I'm just painting a couple teeth here, front and back, and then I rotate that pinion around enough times to make sure that the ring gear has made contact with the pinion about five or six times and I'll do that in both directions so the ring gear needs to contact the pinion five or six times in one direction and then five or six times in the other direction I'm only doing it one time on camera but just to give you an idea what happens off camera that's what I do now let's look at the drive patterns okay so we're gonna look on the drive side the pattern is slightly low it's not completely on the, the heel of the tooth, but it's kind of low, so it's not something that I'm terribly excited about, but if it makes noise, we know exactly where to go to fix it, and that's just increasing the backlash a little bit. The, uh, the coast side is pretty much where it should be. It's slightly above center, but everything is nice and fading in and out, and that's kind of what you're looking for. You're not really looking for any hard lines at the end of it, so the drive side pattern, slightly low. Um, that means the backlash is a little tight, and we measured it a little tight, so I'm not too terribly upset about that. It should wear in that extra half thou to be where it should be, and that pattern will change as it wears in. These are the side seals. Again, you want to grease the lips, grease the outers, and then drive them in flush, just like you do with the pinion. So there's a little STP grease, which is stay together please grease, and uh, you want to lube it just a little bit. A little goes a long way. You don't want to cover this stuff in grease and then uh, position it relatively flat and then I took the same little uh, aluminum tube that I had earlier to drive some of those races in and I'm just putting it slightly off center and uh, they're not the exact size uh, that it needs to be to drive that race in perfectly but 
Uh, if you move it just off to the side, it will actually hit on that case and stop flush right where it needs to. Wipe off the extra, flip over the case, do the same thing on the other side. And I'm just using an old bearing race and the uh, steel driver kit that I showed you earlier. Again, just different ways to skin a cat. Hopefully that helps you. If you don't have that little aluminum tube, you can always use the old bearing race of uh, another one that you removed and just drive it flush. Now, as you can see on these side axles, there is a difference in length, meaning that one goes on one side and the other goes on the other side. You do not want to get those mixed up. A little bit of grease on the splines and then a little bit of grease where that uh, seal rides. Now, as you can see, this axle is uh, the longer one. Just tap it in place and look at the center of that axle. See how there's only one little dot? I'm going to show you the, uh, the other driver's side axle, I'm sorry, the passenger side axle, and see how it's got that little other little weird indention? That's just one more way to tell which axle goes on the which side. So when you're tearing this thing apart, you might want to pay attention to that stuff and uh, make note of it. A little bit of grease, and then just tap it in place. There's a little bitty circlips inside the carrier, so if you're having problems getting these to drive all the way down, make sure you're not bending the circlip or that circ clip is worn out of spec to where it's kind of blocking everything. So recenter it and then uh, drive it all the way. You want to rotate both the axles, make sure the spider gears rotate freely, nothing is binding. And then uh, if you want to check everything out one last time, you can go to the pinion, make sure the whole thing drives around like it's supposed to. last thing we got to do is put the gasket and the cover on so for this I absolutely wholeheartedly recommend the use of RTV I use Permatex Optimum 27037 after making sure the diff cover and the diff case area is properly cleaned I just clean it up with that little three inch roll lock bristle brush like I do with everything else and then we're off to the races putting a whole bunch of squiggly lines very very thin squiggly lines all the way around the case lightly tap the uh, gasket in place just kind of press it down a little tappity tap 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 it on in and uh, just get it to sit flat and then we're going to do same thing off to the races make sure all of your diff holes or your bolt holes for the diff are completely covered around with uh, the RTV and then a bunch of squiggly lines all the way around the case and that just ensures there's a nice even bead all the way around and then we're going to do one little final thing stick the case the diff case up on top of a, uh, a little spacer or hammer i'm just using a hammer in this case because when you put the, uh, the cover on you don't want it resting on the cover that'll kind of shift everything up for the weight of the case so can't do anything without finishing it off in stainless steel hardware. I got these bolts from Zcar Depot if you'd like to get a set yourself. And while this thing is wet, you want to try to not move it around that much. Put all the bolts in where they're supposed to go. They do have lock washers with it. And then I just take a socket with my fingers and snug it up. It's not even compressing that lock washer all the way down. Just going around in a star pattern and then waiting an entire night. The next day I come out after this RTV has completely dried. Take a hand ratchet, snug everything up, which does lock down that lock washer. And then we're going to break out the trusty old torque wrench. And yes, I use a torque wrench on everything. It's a habit. It's a good one to get in the habit of. Uh, a lot of problems you run into with most of the things you probably work on are stripped bolts, tightened bolts, broken bolts, or uh, things like that. So a good way to prevent from over torquing stuff is to break out the torque wrench and get the proper measurements. The uh, torque specs on this, the diff cover bolts are going to be 12 to 17 foot-pounds. I usually just set the torque wrench right in the middle of that, so I think I torque these down to 15 foot-pounds. And uh, go to you, hit the click, and I do this in stages multiple times around the diff. I don't just start torquing bolts all at the same time. After that you put the drain plug in. These are torqued to 30 to 50 foot-pounds. Once again, do not break out the pipe wrench. Uh, this one I'm just going to put, this is the fill plug, I'm just going to put finger type because I still have to put fluid in it so that'll be my reminder for that. 
Another OEM part from Courtesy Nissan is that breather tube, just because the old ones are plastic and they are relatively easy to break. These new ones, I took a dead blow hammer and it fits in there relatively snugly. Pulled the cap off, drove it home, and then put that breather cap back on. Now, earlier I told you, you do need some specialty tools uh, for this project, and that is true. I'm gonna go ahead and show you a quick rundown of everything you're gonna need. And yeah, it's not cheap. Like everything else, quality costs money. You don't want to rely on cheaper tools that you think you're getting the accuracy in which you need from them, but you're absolutely not because they're not properly calibrated and they don't come with any certificates of calibration. These tools and other machinist tools like them do, so you can trust the results that these things are putting out. The first tool you're gonna need, an inch pound torque wrench. Now I use the dial type uh, just because I like it. If you want to cheap out a little bit, uh, you can still get a decent reading and you can use a beam type and I'll leave links in the description below for all of these tools but you can use the beam type inch pound wrench this is to measure the bearing preload to make sure you're within spec in inch pounds so it's very very accurate if you overshoot or undershoot that number from what's listed in the factory service manual you're gonna have a bad day so make sure you get accurate tools to make that happen you're gonna need a dial caliper to measure the shims this is a Mitsutoyu 8 inch dial caliper. You don't need all 8 inches for this project. Uh, you could get away with a 6. And no, we're not going there. Again, quality tools cost money. Mitsutoyu. Mitsu, yeah, Mitsutoyo. I think that's how you say it. Mitsutoyo. Yeah. I went ahead and picked up a Mitsutoyu dial indicator as well because I like stuff in thousandths, and uh, that's what this is. You need a uh, articulating arm to be able to set up your dial indicator. Now, if you get this exact one, it comes with a metric dial indicator, so you can spend an extra $10, $15 and get the articulating, the Noga articulating arm, and it comes with a dial caliper. If, if you want to get, if, or if you already have another dial indicator, you can save 15 or 20 bucks and just get the articulating arm. It's completely up to you. You're gonna need some gear marking compound, and this stuff is just yellow paste, and it helps you make sure that when the pinion and the ring gear are meshing together, that they're meshing properly, and your tooth patterns are all correct. Highly, highly important, especially if you're changing gear sets. You're gonna need a little brush. Now, I just use acid brushes. You can get like a pack of 100 of these. You're gonna need a little bit of grease, uh, obviously oil, fluid, and all that stuff. Oh, you're gonna need a bearing race and seal driver kit uh, you're going to need a shop press now i'm using a 20 ton shop press you don't need anything that heavy duty any shop press will do you're just trying to press the races into where they fit in the differential uh, you might need a slide hammer kit uh, to pull out the axle stub the stub axles or axle half shafts or whatever they're called the stub axles that are in the actual differential itself and then beyond that, it's just normal tools, maybe a couple pry bars, some hammers, a dead blow, ratchets, sockets, you know, all the normal stuff that you probably already have. But that pretty much wraps up the specialty tools. All right, guys, the differential part three finished. It's completely rebuilt, all new bearings and seals, and it looks beautiful, and it's ready to go back in the car. So the only thing left to do now is to fill it up with oil. Uh, do not forget to do that or you will ruin your brand new rebuilt differential. So highly important. Lubrication is very, very important. Uh, I usually tag these and say like fill before use or put a red tag or something on it. But uh, I still have the whole rest of the car to build and nothing has fluid in it. So typically I'll get everything together and then just go through the car forward to backwards and backwards and forwards and make sure everything is a proper level. So. If you like this video, click that thumbs up button. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and click that subscribe button. We're still working towards that 1,000 subscriber threshold to where the ads that you see actually make a difference in my life because I'll get like a quarter of a penny from every 1,000 ads that show. Right now, you're just seeing ads and I get nothing from it. So it's just annoying to you, just as annoying as it would be, but I will be getting pennies to allow me to continue building crazy little projects like this one. So I would appreciate that very much. If you have any questions, leave a comment below and I'll do my best to reply as quickly as possible. I appreciate you guys as always. And until next time, thanks for watching this one.